Don't be concerned about the title here. I am going to be talking about OpenACC, but I'm going to be talking about OpenACC as a tool to refactor applications for future hybrid architectures. Um, as was discussed this morning, I really enjoyed the presentation this morning. Um, we really are facing a, a time when we have various architectures uh, from AMD, NVIDIA, Intel, and who can guess what other vendors. Uh, but one thing is for certain, they all are very similar. They all are going to require you to have four levels of parallelism. Um, as a matter of fact, if you think about it, um, you know, at Oak Ridge, which is where I've been working for the last eight years, um, the number of nodes on Jaguar when it, um, when it had the Opterons with 200, the number of nodes on Titan where we now have NVIDIA GPUs is 200. So the number of nodes did not increase, but the power of the node increased significantly. And that's what you're going to be seeing over the next four to five years, where the node itself is just gonna get more powerful. And utilizing that node is where your challenge is going to come from. Uh, and so I think we have a pretty good technique uh, for developing codes to really uh, take advantage of the node architecture and still really um, utilize good, efficient MPI between nodes. All right, um, so there's a big challenge here because so many applications today are MPI only. Now, I've been given a talk such as this for probably four years, so there's a little more OpenMP in some of the applications now, but still, there, there are still those people who think, well, heck, many core, I can run MPI on every core. Certainly can't do that on an accelerator. And when Intel, the Intel Knights Corner and Knights Landing, you don't want to run MPI on every one of those cores. So you really have to think about threading on the node. The other thing is vectors. So I contend that there are very few people who really know how to vectorize code. The situation is, in many of the workshops I give, is someone will come up and say, well, my application doesn't vectorize. And I said, well, why do you say that? Well, the compiler won't vectorize it. Well, it's not up to the compiler, it's up to you to code the uh, kernel, the application, so it will vectorize. The other thing you really have to start worrying about is where your arrays are. Okay, are they gonna be on the host? Are they gonna be on the accelerator? Good question earlier this morning. What happens if I don't have enough memory on the accelerator to hold all my data? Well, you have to worry about dealing with that. It's even with the night's landing where you don't have a host, it's going to be a self-hosted accelerator, that you still are going to have a relatively small, very fast memory, and a very large, slow memory. So you're gonna have two memories. There's a single address space, but you are gonna have two memories. So 
The whole idea is you want to design an application that will run well on a system, a hosted accelerator like Titan, uh, a non-hosted uh, MPP architecture like Knight's Landing, um, or a simple Xeon, uh, Sandy Bridge or Ivy Bridge or Haswell, et cetera. And we believe that there is definitely a good way of doing that by using MPI and OpenMP and then extend the OpenAP, OpenMP with OpenACC for that hosted accelerator. And then once um, OpenMP uh, 4.0 is really portable, you know, one of the problems you have with standards like OpenMP 4.0, even if Cray gave you a OpenMP 4.0 the end of this year, which we will, uh, no one else will. And so the code isn't portable. So right now, OpenACC is portable. And so there is uh, a way of coming up with a portable application that can, in fact, run across all these architectures. This is an older OpenACC slide. The bottom line uh, right now, I think CAPS is out of business. Um, Cray and NVIDIA bought PGI, so uh, Cray and NVIDIA slash PGI have OpenACC, and also um, I understand that someone is working with G77 to put OpenACC or GCC and put OpenACC into that. So there is portability across a number of uh, systems. But there's still strategic risk factors. Intel did not support OpenACC. Um, and basically what that means is there's a large community there that uses the Intel compiler that is somewhat concerned. Now, we believe OpenACC will continue. It turns out that there's a lot more power in OpenACC than there is in OpenMP 4.0. Uh, and, of course, that will change in the future. From our standpoint, we will support both. Uh, and, I mean, it would take you know, all the applications I, I've uh, done with OpenACC, it would take me less than a day to convert them to OpenMP 4.0. Uh, so it's, you know, they're, the names are different to protect the innocent, I guess. Um, but really, I view OpenACC as a hammer. And I'm not going to teach you about the hammer. I'm going to teach you how to use the hammer. Um, so I want to concentrate on the node architecture. There are more processors per node, so you really need to do threading. There are, there's hyper-threading, okay? So you really have low-level threading as well as your typical OpenMP threading across uh, processors. Vectors are becoming more important. Memory hierarchy is becoming more complex. And the thing that is really going to bite you is scalar performance is going to be slower. As soon as Intel goes to a non-hosted accelerator, their scalar performance is going to drop by a factor of five compared to the Xeon. So you have to make up for that. You know, everyone should know by heart Amdahl's law. I remember I gave a workshop at Amdahl 
uh, the, this was in the early days of Cray, and they did not know Amdahl's Law, which was kind of surprising to me. But anyways, everyone knows Amdahl's Law? Good, thank you. <laughs> oh, good. See, you must have were taught. <laughs> okay. Now, vectors are becoming more important. Um, NVIDIA, you know, has SIMT, but I view it as a vector. It really isn't a vector. It's more like the ILLIAC-4. Anyone know what the ILLIAC-4 was? You know, it's SIMD. Um, so you have all these 32 uh, processors that all have to do the same thing at the same time. Intel's vectorization is interesting, to say the least. Vectorizing on Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge is, in fact, I don't want to get too much into history here. And, uh, but anyways, if you vectorize for them, you're kind of lucky if you get a factor of two. But with Haswell and Broadwell, you have a much bigger vector instruction. So you can do a fuse multiply add and have uh, generate 16 floating point operations per cycle. So vector, if you vectorize, on the mic, it's also going to be that same big vector length. Uh, now, one, a lot of the compilers today, if you have an if statement in your loop, won't vectorize it because of the overhead of generating vector instructions. But that should change for Haswell, Broadwell, and the mics. Okay, memory organization is going to be your most important thing to solve. Um, and the whole problem here is it takes more power to move data than it does to add or do a operation on that data. So the goal here is to develop a single source code that implements OpenMP and OpenACC in such a way that the application can run efficiently on everything. And I've done it on a lot of code, probably around 10 applications right now. In doing this, you really have to identify several levels of parallelism. I said four a couple minutes ago, and I'll add it after this. Uh, MPI PGAS between the nodes, threading on the node, and one of the things you should think about is doing MPI across the uh, uniform memory regions. Like on a socket, you, you pretty much uh, all the cores access the same memory. So you, you kind of want to do your MPI where an MPI task has uniform memory access. Then there's vectorization. The fourth level of parallelism is hyperthreading. Uh, you have that on Haswell, Broadwell, of course, Ivy Bridge and Sandy Bridge, uh, and on the mics. Um, but at the bottom line, you do want a performance portable application. Okay, how many of you know about the Hamino code? It's a very simple example. Well. Not as simple as the ones that were used this morning, but it, it is simple. It has one major computational loop, very easy to introduce OpenMP, and it's excellent to see how to implement OpenACC. So that's what I'm gonna go through. Now, in all my slides, I use Cray tools and the Cray compiler. Now, Tools such as Cray's are available from other vendors as well to, to get the kind of data. But uh, how many of you have access to a Cray? Ah, that's good. 
and the rest of you, I have blank purchase orders at the back <laughs> over there. Uh, I wish it was that easy. <laughs> okay, step one. Even when something's simple, you have to profile the application. Now, one thing that uh, I have forced Cray to do, see, I'm kind of the biggest user of Cray's tools and compilers, and when I find something I don't like, they are forced to fix it right away, or else I tell people like yourself how bad the Cray compiler is. <laughs> so, you know, I think Cray compiler's great. Uh, but anyways, uh, one of the things that I convinced them to do is instrument do loops, in addition to uh, routines. So this is showing us that uh, one of the loops in the routine Jacobi is using almost, well, 94% of the CPU time. And then the send routines are down there, but you can see that it is, in fact, the top dog. Now, I even have the ability with this, uh, with Craypat, to get the, the loop iteration counts. So I see that this is actually in Jacobi a triple nested loop, actually quadruply nested. Uh, there's a kind of a iteration loop on the outside and then a triple nested uh, mesh loop. Uh, but I can see that it's, you know, 128 by 128 by 256, which is a good meaty loop to work on. Now we have a totally awesome tool that for those of you who have done OpenMP, one of the most difficult things in putting OpenMP in is scoping the loop. So we have those of you with access to Craze, you might look at Reveal. Reveal looked at this loop and say, well, voila, I can very easily OpenMPize that loop. Uh, and you can see that there's a little comment uh, directive inserted by Cray reveal, maybe incomplete. That's just, you know, if we screwed up, then we can point to that and say, hey, we may have not be done. But anyways, no, they, it did the right thing here. We always do this default none, just to make sure that everything gets scoped. You notice there is a reduction function in there uh, but it, this is the major loop, okay? And this is kind of the compiler listing from the Cray compiler that shows you that the K loop is being multi-task, that's what the M is. The V is saying that inner loop is vectorized and it's unrolled by three. I don't know why they chose three, but that's what the compiler figured out. Uh, so that's um, what it did with the OpenMP. So what we're going to do now is immediately introduce OpenACC. So I have the, the biggest loop in the program. Now even if this were a big program, I would only do the most uh, compute intensive loop. Okay, and this is all it is. I basically take the OpenMP and I get rid of the shared because OpenACC does not have shared data. Okay, it only has private data, uh, a private clause. It also has a reduction clause and it's exactly the same. The Sentinel is ACC instead of OMP uh, so there, if I have the NVIDIA module loaded, then that bay or underscore OpenACC is true, uh, and it will use the OpenACC. If not, it uses the OpenMP. So I just OpenMPize this code. Now it's going to run terrible. 
because I haven't done anything about moving data. But what I'm doing, and PGI does this as well, is that the compiler is going to say, OK, I'm going to put this thing over on the accelerator. That's the capital G's. And the, there are two levels of parallelism. The, uh, the K loop is being spread across the SMs. And the inner loop is being, those are the, within the warp. So that's the vector part of this. But more importantly, the compiler says, OK, you idiot. If you want to do this on the accelerator, I have to copy P, A, B, C, work one, bound, work two over there. Uh, and I also have to copy work two back. OK, now I'll run this for you, and I get the right answers. But all of this data motion is, you're not going to get good performance. And in fact, when I profile this version, I see that my copying of data is actually using, you know, probably 87% of the time. Um, and so the kernel itself is where See that Jacobi ACC sync wait? That is the host waiting for that kernel to be finished. Okay. So I just did an open ACC. It ran on the accelerator, but it ran slower. Um, so, anyways, whenever you get a profile like this and you see that the top uh, you want to hit the top bottlenecks. Okay, so basically, uh, my next, oh, these are 15 steps, and I'll give you a summary of those steps at the end. Okay, what I want to do now is I want to move my data motion outside of my iteration. Because this is doing a Jacobi iteration. And it's actually doing 566 of those. And I can move most of my data movement outside of that iteration loop. And so I introduced this new directive called an ACC data region. OK, and, and I actually put in the data region to copy the major work arrays over to the accelerator in the main program. And now when I come in here, I actually tell the compiler that A, A P, B, C, bound, and work one are all present. And then this uh, WGOSA, I want to tell it, I want to say, it's either present. If it isn't present, I want you to create it. I don't want you to copy, but if you haven't already created it, create it, and next time through, you don't have to create it. Then you, you see this iteration loop where basically it's going over these iterations and down lower. It's going to check to see if we've uh, satisfied the conversion criteria. Uh, so here's my code, the open ACC. OK. And uh, now, now, though, I have a problem. This is the end of my data down at the bottom here. That's the whole routine. But I'm communicating with other nodes. So there are two things I have to communicate. There is this P array that I have to exchange the halos. So this, this is going to show you really good to do your example from this morning. So you can really impress him by, you know, 
figuring out how to do the MPI from this example and put it in there. So, but anyways, um, so what I have to do prior to send P is I have to update the host with P. And then send P is going to exchange halos. And then I have to update the device with P after the halos have been exchanged. And then I, I've already updated the host with WG, uh, WGOSA, and I do a MPI all reduce um, of that. And of course, that's being done on the host. Okay. So, uh, this is now basically the compiler is saying, okay, now based, what you've done is you've created this data region. All right, and now let's look at uh, down below here. You can see where we're updating the host. And now, here again, I've told the compiler that these things are present. And so it's telling, now remember the last slide, it had all these things that it had to copy over. Well, now it only has, tells us it's going to allocate memory for that variable, if not already present. Okay, and then, um, it basically is talking that WRK2 has to be moved to the accelerator. Okay, um, and then there's some other things in there about optimizing the loops. Now if we look at this, uh, there's a couple, we're still, our kernel itself is still really way down in the weeds. Well, it's gone up to 8%. And notice that we are now running twice as fast. We're down to 32 seconds. Uh, but we're still, those copies of P, moving P over to the host to do that halo exchange, and then moving P back to the accelerator is using 66% of the time. Now, what are, what are we doing inefficiently there? Anyone have a guess? If we're exchanging halos, do we have to move all of P? No. You don't want to move more data than you need to because of that flimsy old PCI Express link. Now, herein comes something that you have to pretty much memorize. And this is something that, believe me, we have looked at trade-offs and everything on this. And you want to pack all of your messages on the accelerator, not on the host. So a lot of people said, well, do the interior points where, um, you know, you don't need the halos. And then, but then you have to exchange a double halo in order to do the differencing on the host for the halo stuff. So you still have more data to exchange. Now, this code used derived types. Do not use derived types. Don't do it. Because that's going to pack and unpack on the host. That's what a derived type does. It packs up a buffer and sends it. So what you want to do is you want to pack up the buffers on the accelerator, move the buffers to the host, do the communication, move the, the receive buffer back to the device, unpack. Very nice. And this is all you need to do to do it. This is only one halo. It gets more complicated if you have a higher order differencing. Oh, by the way, this is packing and this is unpacking. <laughs> but anyways, you have the code and it does work. So 
uh, amino actually gives you the megaflop rates. So the original running on 16 nodes with four MPI tasks per node ran in 78 megaflops. Then we did um, uh, threads. So there, there are two versions of OpenMP. One version of OpenMP actually um, only did the highest compute. The other version did the initialization. Now, with OpenMP, I don't know if Barbara mentioned this, but one of the big problems with OpenMP is this whole idea of locality. And so you really want to do first touch in order to get the arrays on the, you know, initialized on the nodes that are on the cores that are going to be using them. And then we have several versions of OpenACC. So you see that um, we ended up running four times faster than the best OpenMP version. Okay, it should really be more than that. Uh, if you think about it, this machine that I'm running this on has a um, uh, Intel socket and an NVIDIA GPU. Now that node is the same real estate as two IB or Intel sockets, right? So break even in our view is if you run twice as fast. Okay. And so, well, this is running four times as fast, but you should be able to do better than that. And there are ways of doing better than that. Uh, one of the things that is fairly recent is this whole idea of GPU direct. Uh, now, it turns out that if you have an MPI library that really understands that some arrays may come from the device, you may not have to go through memory. So there is an open ACC directive, basically where you have a host data region. And in that host data region, you can tell uh, the compiler that in that region, I want to use F on the device. So I have a device pointer. And now what is being done here is I am actually passing a device pointer to MPI. Now it turns out that it depends this GPU direct where you go, uh, where you go to the other GPU without going through host memory is very good for smaller messages. But if your message is large, and I forgot the, the magic largeness, but anyways, if, if it's larger, our MPI actually breaks large messages up and pipelines them to get overlap out on the interconnect because we have such a good interconnect. But, uh, and it turns out the MPI library itself will look at that length and it may do GPU direct where it doesn't go through host memory or it may go through host money memory if the message is large enough. So, um, you know, we kind of want to tell people that just in case they really look at their uh, uh, statistics and saying, well, that's going through uh, memory. But anyways, this is extremely important to really optimize uh, these transfers. Okay, this is um, one of the big codes I did for um, the acceptance of Titan. Um, 
so this is S3D. S3D was the very first OpenACC um, application that ran on 15,000 nodes. Uh, it scaled all the way up, and I want to show you some of the optimizations that that required. Uh, you can see this is the profile, and the reaction rate vec is the kernel that actually does the chemistry uh, in the combustion. This is a combustion code. Uh, this second kernel is doing one of the really major stencils. Um, and then this third um, line is actually the thing that's doing all of the halo transfers. So you can see all of the halo transfers are actually taking 5% of the total wall clock. Uh, and then uh, compute coefficients, so you can see that that's a computation. Every time you see uh, ACC async kernel, then that's really the kernel that's executing. Copies um, are annotated there, et cetera. But this thing ended up running seven times faster than the Jaguar node. Uh, and so, and it, I'll tell you, it really found a lot of bugs in the NVIDIA hardware, I'll tell you. <laughs> there is a capability on um, OpenAC, on CUDA, to have up to 16 parallel streams. Okay, and so one of the things, for example, in Amino, you actually are doing um, one, two, three, four, five, six sends and six receives. And there's no reason why all six of those can't go on in parallel. As a matter of fact, the six packs can all go on in parallel. And the simple way of doing that, I should show you, huh, I apologize. All you have to do is you, after your open ACC, all you do is you do an async with a number. Now, these are, this is an excerpt from S3D where I'm actually packing uh, 23 buffer, or excuse me, 29 buffers. And uh, every one of these are going on in parallel, where they're basically packed, sent, received, unpacked, all in parallel. Those, now, 29 is more than 16, so basically what happens is uh, 16 go on in parallel, and then when one finishes, then another one comes in. So you can have 16 at a time. Um, okay, so this streams on, on OpenACC is extremely important. Um, one thing I also want to give you is I gave a um, three-day workshop at Oak Ridge last um, summer. And all of the presentations are still on the website. And one of the things I'll do is I'll get that link because that it has very good stream examples in it. Okay, so the whole idea is, you know, you, you, you find that very important loop, you then work on that loop, and then you go minimizing data transfers by moving up your data region. And when you move up your data region, you have to take into account all these message passing and other loops that access that data. You either have to transfer data back to the host to do that or put OpenACC on those loops as well 
and bring them in onto the accelerator. So that's those, that first 12 steps gets you up where, okay, I've optimized my uh, data movement, and that's the very first thing you should do optimization-wise. Now I want to optimize kernel performance. Now, our goal in OpenACC, the uh, um, OpenACC compiler's goal is to get within 15% of CUDA coded. And we've been able to achieve that except when there, are, in, in other words, the Hamino thing has been written in CUDA, but they totally changed uh, the, the process. They do a lot of uh, streaming of the data and is so that they can overlap more message passing with the computation. And so they really changed what Hamino, or at least the process it was going by. Now, so this is where we now get into the area of how do we optimize kernel performance. And this is the area where what you're doing here typically really helps you on the CPU as well. And this is a great example. So this is one of the OpenACC loops. It looks pretty simple. Uh, and, you know, the, the thing is, is there's, I hate array syntax. I absolutely hate array syntax because the compiler doesn't optimize array syntax well. So the first thing I'm gonna do is get rid of the array syntax. The other thing I'm gonna do is when you have small loops, you wanna get rid of them, okay? So basically that turns into this. Now, given that I was able to unroll those loops, it's extremely important on the accelerator to use these temporaries to avoid referencing uh, device memory. Because when you dimension a temporary, it's gonna go to device memory. Uh, now you, you do have the ability in CUDA to specify that it's a shared array. But in Fortran or C, you really want to make sure that you use scalars because then the compiler will optimize those and not store them. So it turns out on this code, it ran five times faster on the accelerator and twice as fast on the host. Okay, so this, I mean, I love, this is good, no array syntax, no little do loops. Now, people might say, well, it's more code and I can't read it. I can read that just fine. This is another one, though. This is the kind of idea that someone would run this and say, the compiler didn't vectorize this loop. Well, the problem with this is a temperature interpolation loop. And it turns out this is very important for the chemistry that you, your mesh loop is on the outside and inside you're basically going through the iteration to converge within a tolerance. Um, and that inner part doesn't vectorize. The outer loop doesn't vectorize because of that exit iteration and all that kind in that stop statement in the middle there. And so when you have a situation like this on the accelerator, you have two options. This is running slower than on the host, on the accelerator, because it's running in scalar mode. So what you want to do is you want to vectorize this. So you can vectorize this. All you do is you put the iteration loop on the outside. And now your mesh loop is on the inside 
and basically what you're doing is you're doing the computation for a strip. And our strips are like 256. And I do that strip and I test to see how many converge. And those that converge, I set this array equal to one when it converges. If it doesn't converge, I leave it at zero. And I keep on going through the iteration loop until everything converges. Now, this isn't gonna work very well if the number of iterations to do one of those cells is large. But in my investigation on most of these problems, this iteration loop typically ran two to three times before the temperature converged. So I don't expect you to read this, but you know that, and now this does run slower on the, on the host now, but believe me, this, will, this runs faster on Knight's Corner. When you get to those Intel systems that have vector, better vectorization capabilities, then uh, you, know, you can have a performance portable. But on Sandy Bridge, this actually runs slower. Oh, this is a cool thing. Um, so one of the things, we were running S3D on these 15,000 nodes. Now, um, Titan is a 3D torus. And the problem is, it's very hard to map your 3D problem to a 3D torus where everyone, all your neighbors are close. So basically, what we are doing here is we have all of these messages in flight. Now I'm not gonna do a wait on an individual message. I am gonna wait on any message. So the first message that comes in, I actually, and this shows you that ascent clause. So I'm gonna update the device when a message comes in with the appropriate uh, array asynchronously. So what this outer loop is doing is it's cycling until all the messages have been received and all of those updates are being done in parallel. So this is the kind of thing you have to get as much running in parallel as possible. This is an extremely important uh, chart to look at when you're working with um, the accelerator. This is kind of a timeline of uh, several MPI processes, and it shows you time being used on the accelerator, time being used on the host, and you're looking for gaps. You're looking for gaps where the host isn't doing anything. Maybe you can get it to do something else, or, or maybe um, you're not using streams enough where you can break up. Sometimes it's better to break up a big computation on the accelerator into smaller ones and overlap it. Okay. These are the steps for refactoring an application for performance portable. First and foremost, we wanna profile the application. Then you wanna scope the variables in the major loop. Then we use OpenACC compiler to identify data motion required. That's hard work. Let the compiler do it for you. Once that loop is, is analyzed, now we look at the next highest loop. At some point, we're gonna see that we wanna move that data region outside of the time step loop. And once we work outward like that, 
we're going to encounter things like I.O., communication, other loops that have to be um, where you have to use OpenACC. Now, you have to make sure you test versions after each step. It's so easy to forget, if you're not using reveal, to forget a private variable. And what you've done is you've introduced a race condition. So as you start adding these other loops, you want to, I'm really bad at saying, ah, heck, I can do these 10 loops and then test. And I do those 10 and I get the wrong answers. And then I have to back up and I do five of them. And ah, it's much better to test after each loop. And don't really worry about performance, just the accuracy. And then at the very end, you really want to look um, for those. You generate the compiler listing with this minus RM, at least on the Craig compiler. And I do a, a string search for copy. And it'll show me all of the copies where I'm copying data, and I want to make sure that I understand why that data is being copied. Okay, um, and so these are just additional. This is really optimizing your data transfer. Uh, and then you want to start um, gathering statistics on the device code itself. And if the bottleneck is a data copy, you got to go back to nine to uh, look for these data movements that aren't necessary. If it's kernel performance, you really want to make, oh, that's one thing I forgot to mention. In Hamino, we only had two levels of parallelism. It's best to have three. And so you can use directives to force the compiler to do the outer one is going to be, good Lord, brain. Um, the inner one's vector, the next one is worker, and the third one out is gain. Gain, worker, and uh, vector. Uh, you really want to have those three levels. And then you really want to start introducing CUDA streams and then start looking at timelines to see when uh, more can be overlapped. And wow, I cannot believe it. Look at that. I have three minutes for questions. Questions? Any questions? So how, how do you relate uh, your uh, your pitch for ACC with uh, with the previous speaker with Tim's uh, pitch for open? I don't like his pitch <laughs> because you know the thing he didn't tell you is then you're reliant on them for the rest of your life. Assuming that doesn't become a standard. <laughs> 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 oh, okay. <laughs> um, no, I really, I, I guess I believe in all the years I've been doing this, the only safe and very workable approach is to use extensions for C, C++, and Fortran. And that are standard. Now, OpenACC is not, quote, standard, because Intel isn't there. But OpenMP 4.0 is. And I'm sure that everyone, PGI will be supporting that, I'm sure. So, um, and Intel will be supporting it. So that's going to give you good portability. But the good question, there was a question back here? Uh, yeah. The packing and unpacking the data for GPUs before cleaning it up. Um, are there just like functions you can use? I wish. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. See, the, so much depends on, on, like, for example, in this, you only had to pack one variable. It turns out if, if you have to do halo exchanges for two or three, you want to put them all in the same pack loop. And so if you had a runtime or a, a function to call, you would end up calling three or four functions. But I, I really think eventually someone will do that for you. They're just not available right now. But really, you get good at it. You really do. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so um, for me, the, the big strength that CUDA has that some of these other alternatives don't have is that they have a huge uh, amount of libraries, such ah. as a CUDA 4A transform, a CUDA blast, and things yeah. like that. Yeah. And if I wanted to use OpenACC to accelerate my code, I could accelerate certain portions that I wrote. But ultimately, I would also need an open ACC version of these libraries. No. So you know that host data region? Within that, I could say use this device array and call a CUDA routine. So you can call CUDA libraries. There's a big uh, um, uh, GE code that they use to do the engine design and they use FFTs, and it's all open ACC except those FFTs that are the CUDA library. So that host data region is what you use. I'm glad you asked that question because I forgot to mention that.